Yeah, good evening. It is good to see us here this evening. It's good to be here. Grab your songbook. Let's start things off just over in the glory land. Page number 65. Page number 65. Well, Gary's running the camera equipment this evening. Miss Terry Nim's out of town, so uh, we'll lead some singing here. 65. When you find that, let's stand our feet. <clears throat> Prepared where the saints are by just over in the glory land, and I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land. I join the happy angel band just over in the glory land, just over in the glory. blood washed strong I will shout and sing just over in the glory land that hosannas to Christ the Lord and King just over in the glory land just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory land just over Over in the glory land. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for another opportunity to be in thy house again this evening. Thank you for the time that we have here. And I pray, Lord, tonight that you would just take thy word and, Lord, that you would teach us to us this evening. Thank you for this time that we come apart in the middle of the week and we separate ourselves into, uh, be f into the fellowship and to the teaching and the preaching and just the presence of you. I pray, God, tonight that thy will be done in our lives. Thank you for these that have come and those that are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated this evening. <clears throat> Well, I tell you what, this is a historic week. If you didn't ask me, yesterday I turned on the news and uh, they said, peace, peace, peace. There's peace in the Middle East. And uh, President Trump signed that treaty uh, and said, peace. And I, I you know, I just um, I got uh, this little political side of me too. So I turned over to CNN. And uh, they put it like on the fourth page of, uh, of news there. And they said, the Carnal News Network. Um, <clears throat> but they said, the, uh, uh, well, this was going to happen regardless of who's in the White House. They wouldn't give him no credit for anything. Of course, they hate him and, and, the, and their wickedness here. But boy, I tell you what, when uh, that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and President Trump and uh, what he did, this is so interesting because I've read two or three things about it. But what he did, he left the Palestinians out. And he went in there and signed the peace treaty and he said, we'll get a hold of them later. <laughs> They've always been the trouble with it. It seems like all through the Bible it's been the Palestines, the Palestinians, uh, that's always caused trouble there. Uh, ever since David beat Goliath, it's always been nothing but uh, uh, trouble. But I tell you what, uh, I was driving through Ohio yesterday and when they said, there's peace. There's peace. I say, say it one more time, because the Bible said when they say peace, peace, there is, there's peace. Then, sudden destruction. Ah, oh, Jesus is coming, friend, and it's all coming together. Who would have ever thought that? And I just, boy, I just got excited and started just uh, praising the Lord. And I said, Lord, help us all to get our affairs in order, uh, because Jesus is coming. And there, um, and it is a... Um, it's the biggest deal 
in the news today. We got fires, we got hurricanes, we've got uh, all this garbage with uh, the political system going on right now. I tell you what, but the biggest news uh, is the fact that uh, see he 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 moved the capital to Jerusalem and now he signed the peace treaty with them. I say, friends, look up, look up. Well, let's not forget about our services, and uh, uh, of course, on Sunday, Sunday evening, we'll have a uh, a lesson, but we'll also uh, take a part of that time and just kind of go over some things business-wise. Now, it'll be Sunday evening of this week. Let's remember these prayer requests here. Brother Joe, if you could, if anybody, well, let's do this first before you have to walk up. Does anybody have a request this evening? You got something you'd like to mention? All right, Brother no, I don't want to. I don't know. I want to discourage. I just, um, you know, Joe's getting older, and um, so <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but let's remember Jennifer Booth for Shirley Johnson, and then of course uh, Linda uh, Fessel for Betty Doss. Pray for the Jack Lundy family, and I talked to one of my friends uh, that I grew up with the other day. His wife, she's almost uh, died this year a couple times because of, um, uh, well, she had a heart attack, and then she's got bad diabetes, and she went into a coma, different things like that. Uh, his name is Joe Sears, and he asked if we would pray for his wife, Tammy. Uh, let's pray for Dylan Marshall, for Jennifer Camper, for Sue Smith. Uh, for Nancy Chapman, for Jody Hancock, and of course, as, as I was watching the news, let's remember to pray for all these that are um, uh, dealing with the uh, aftermath of the uh, hurricane. We'll probably feel a little bit of that, of course, tomorrow as the rain comes in, nothing to what they're going through. They said some of it was up to 20 inches of rain just overnight, and that's just a whole lot there, and let's remember to pray, yes. Yeah, <clears throat> Excuse me. concerning that, my uh, brother lives down there 30 miles north of Pensacola, Oh, wow. And I got a hold of them. They have no power right now. They've had 15 inches of rain in the last two days, and they can't get out because there's no way. It's flooded both sides of them, so they're stuck. All right. Yeah. Well, let's pray for all of those. Definitely let's pray for those in the fires out hmm. in California. My daughter lives in Los Angeles, said they're wearing masks out there for breathing purposes there, uh, and the haze everywhere, and there's just a cloud, and that thing's coming this way too they're talking about. Yes, brother? Yeah, we had a discussion before church, us fellas, and uh, what's going on in California. They're trying to lock the pastors up, and the people that are going to church, they want to fine them $1,000 and put them in jail. But uh, like you said, you better get your house in order. Hey, and, uh, I believe these guys will go to church, and I believe a lot of the people will go to church, and I would too. And a lot of people will get, if this if they allow this to happen, but... They've got lawsuits out, and it's going to be go to the Supreme Court eventually. So we need to pray. And yes, yeah, so let's do that. Let's definitely pray. Pray. Uh, pray for this election. I believe this is a a turning point, turning point toward wickedness. If one party gets in there, and we know who that is, and then the turning point uh, to maybe preserve a little bit of what we've had. So let's continue. Let's ask the prayer. Now, God's going to set up who he's going to set up. We know that because everything's in his time. And we praise the Lord that uh, we always trust him. All right. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go ahead and pray. We'll take his prayer request to the, to the, uh, to the Lord and then get you a songbook. And while he's taking up the offering, we'll sing page number 119. All right, page number 119. So let's pray. Heavenly Father. Again, this evening, we bring these prayer requests to you. Lord, as Paul said, we mention their names. God, we give them to you. We trust, Lord, thy will be done. The lives of each of these, bless I pray those that are suffering right now because of these, uh, the hurricanes, the fires, all the things that are going on in this world. Lord, everything, everything is just so out of whack because we've left you out. God, I pray you please uh, condition our hearts to turn to you in every way, every day, and every minute of every day. Father, I pray you do that. Keep thy people safe in the midst of all this. Save souls because we're out witnessing for thee. Bless, I pray, this offering this evening and our time we have in the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, page number 119 there. <clears throat> Sing better standing. 
In the dark of the midnight have I altered my face while the storm howls above me and there's no hiding place in the crash of the thunder precious Lord hear my cry keep me safe till the storm passes by till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever Many times Satan whispered, there is no need to try, for there's no end of sorrow, there's no hope by and by, but I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the storms never darken the sky. And the storms come no more Let me stand in thy presence On that bright, peaceful shore In that land where the tempest Never comes Lord, may I dwell with thee When the storm passes by Till the storm passes over Till the thunder sounds no more Till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Amen. Reach down there and grab your Bible and let's go to Daniel chapter number 12 this evening. Daniel. <clears throat> Chapter number 12. <clears throat> uh, Daniel chapter number 12. I got all my notes backwards here. <laughs> it's Satan. <evening. laughs> That's all right. I'm going to start from the end and see if we can figure out where the beginning was. So, Daniel chapter 12, very familiar passage of scripture here, but again, we've been talking a little bit about wisdom. I want to kind of talk about tonight on this subject. The fear of the Lord is the end of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the end of wisdom. Uh, look, if you would, in Daniel chapter number 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation ever, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. That's the day right there we're living in today. That's where we are. And nobody that uh, has any... You read the Bible, everyone will see that, how it just fits in this day and time. So um, we're going to pray, and then we'll be seated here. And I want to chat with you about the fear of the Lord is the end of wisdom. Heavenly Father, I pray you please help us this evening. Lord, I pray that we'll grab that final authority in our life. Help us, Lord, to be diligent in these days and times. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. Our position in the time of the end, and that is these days, has really accelerated us into really a different arena 
of response of, of response toward Christianity. I'm talking about people and how they respond to truth in itself. Just a generation or two ago, and majority of everyone in this room knows this because we've seen this, but more people were receptive to the gospel with respect. If they did not accept the gospel, they respected the people that gave it. They respected the house of God. Uh, people didn't break in and rob and vandalize and graffiti a house of God. They would do it to other buildings before they would. Now there's no respect in this era. In this era, we many have no respect or regard to the gospel. That doesn't change, by the way, our message at all, because our message is always true all the time, no matter what the condition of man, because the condition of man is sinfulness. When a society grabs the sinful ways and makes it the governor of how it rules itself, then we get the era that we live in now. We are not, though, the first to ever live in a contradictory time. Truth is, um, there is more in the Bible about how to live in hostile times than there are in peace times. Paul said this, I know how to abound, I know how to be abased. Paul said this, I know whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. He was constantly in battle after battle. The Bible said this, they hazarded their lives for Christ. So there's more in the Bible that tells us how to live now than it does uh, how in a prosperous time. Because I think oftentimes the Bible uh, is... It warns us that prosperous times, we ought to be very much on guard then because people usually let their guard down. And I, I think this is why we're here today. Because just a generation ago, people let their guard down. Our nation was being blessed and prospered after World War II. And things started happening. Then you had uh, a bunch of spoiled kids uh, uh, sewing flags on their britches and burning flags on campuses and then protesting the government. Had never run a lemonade stand trying to tell the government how to run things. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the irony is the government turned to listen to them. The government turned to listen to him. Now, <clears throat> we often hear verses, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We've taught on that. But we must know that the fear of the Lord is the end, or let me put it this way, it is the line that must be drawn to have the right kind of wisdom. Wisdom cannot be without an end that it can stand on. Let me see if I can explain this a little bit more. Wisdom must have a point which no more choice to be sought can be made because the line has to be drawn. Now, that's why the, remember what Truman, I think it was, he put the sign on his desk that the buck stops here. True wisdom has to have an ending point. Now, um, let me give you some step by step, and I'm going to elaborate more on that ending point here. First of all, we desire wisdom. Second, we seek wisdom. Now, what does wisdom include? Wisdom includes knowledge and understanding, the Bible said. To us, information, comprehension, trying to understand the Lord. This is how we grow our wisdom with understanding. Our understanding, though, must have limits or it will go beyond wisdom into foolishness. In other words, our mind is very limited in, in uh, uh, it's limited in its thoughts, but it's not limited in its imagination. And there's the danger. Our imagination, the Bible said, must have an ending a stopping point. Here's what the Bible said. Casting down imaginations, bringing them into obedience to the captivity of Christ. What is he talking about? He said, listen, the fear of the Lord draws the line. When we fear God, it is the end of seeking. When God says, stop here, he's telling us that to imagine beyond his word is nothing but foolishness. And that is where I believe we are in our society that we live in today. Churches used to be full on Wednesday nights. 
They used to be full on Sunday, Sunday morning and Sunday night. Uh, Sunday morning, we have our biggest crowd. Sunday night and Wednesday night, you can't find people with the FBI anymore. Why is that? I guarantee you that they do not fear the Lord like they should. I know some are working. I do know that. Some take vacation. I'm not going to. We all know that. But some people, they wouldn't, they wouldn't show up if you paid them to show up. Now, what is that? I'm sorry to say, that's a falling away. And we've imagined beyond what God said that everything's going to be okay if we do what we want to do. And that's where we are. The fear, so, the fear of the Lord is the beginning because it's what we keep in mind as we seek it. Then it is also the boundary that ends into believing God. See, there are limits to our wisdom. It cannot go, go beyond belief in God. God is the alpha, that's the beginning, and he's the end, uh, the omega, the Bible says. So, when we take God out of our seeking, then it is no longer wisdom. It's foolishness. All right, and I'm going to go somewhere with all go somewhere with all this and bring it down to practical living in just a minute. Now, this brings us to our critical time in history where we live. Our world has turned corrupt, and I mentioned this a minute ago here, not only because we've forgotten the fear of the Lord for the beginning of wisdom, but we've crossed the line and imagined past godly values and even natural principles that God set up to grow our wisdom. That's where we are in our, in our day and time. People, like I say, church membership is, is an option now. God said, hey, I want you to come. There's a reason I want you to come. Well, Lord, I just don't understand it, and I think it'll be all right if I stay at the house. God says, wait a minute now. Your wisdom should stop and end when I said to go to the house of God. All right, let's take another. Let's look at our society today, how, it, how frivolous it is frivolous it is about marriage and vows of marriage. They say if divorce rates have been going down for a long time. The reason it has is because most people don't get married anymore. They just shack up. Now, the Bible says this. That's fornication. That's adultery. Well, you know, I love them. I love them. Then do the right thing and court them and marry them. Do the right thing that way. That's what God says. But, oh, well, you know, here's what I think, Lord, and there's where we are today. That's exactly where we are. Now, we don't dislike anybody uh, for, um, and, and by the way, we always have to keep ourselves in line. So nobody dislikes anybody for going across the line God says you should not cross, but it still means they're wrong. It still means they're wrong. All right, 2016. In 2016, you know what the word of the year was? Post-truth. I think it was Miriam's Dictionary that said the word of the year, post-truth. And I thought about that, you know, as if there is a pre-truth, a truth, and then a post-truth. I mean, that makes no sense to me. It was a testimony to the, this age of no rules, no boundaries, no values, all is okay. Now, if you think this, that's okay. If you think that, that's okay too. That's what they're thinking. That's you know it, um, the term postmodernism. I've read this in several books. It's a term that says we have gone past modernism and reached way beyond it. Now this is the most evident in the way this younger generation thinks. I, I was reading a book uh, this last week and into this week. It was called Wisdom and Eloquence. And reteaching uh, wisdom and eloquence. And basically the title of it, of course, how to learn and then how to communicate what you learn. But I read this quote in here and I wrote it down. For the postmodernist, that's people living today because we live in that post-truth, postmodern thing. Rational arguments no longer convince. Authority is essentially located in oneself. If I can be persuaded that something is true then it is truth. The truth I embrace may be different from, even contradictory to, someone else's truth, but that's okay. So believe the postmodernists. That's how this generation has been taught. It's been taught through media, it's been taught through books, it's been taught through, again, the uh, uh, ways of communication now are 10,000 times 10,000 magnified to where people get all kinds of teaching and thoughts and truth. And sometimes 
sometimes Christians just get, they, they, you just want to throw up your hands and say, what's the use? What's the use? It used to be, you talk to somebody, they'd sit down, they would talk to you. Now, one in a hundred, it seems like, wants to just have anything to talk to you about and not just give you the answers to get rid of you. But that's how people, you know, well, I want to, you know, I, I respect you for believing that. And, you know, you're okay, I'm okay, and we'll be all right. And uh, that's how they think now. But there's no line. There's no lines drawn. Jesus didn't say, I'm... I'm one of those ways, so I'd love it if you come over here. No, Jesus said this, I am the way. I am the truth. It comes across plainer in this generation when this generation says things like this. There's no absolutes. There are no absolutes. It says this, nothing is right or wrong. What they're saying is nothing is 100% true. But you stop and think about it. That in itself is a contradictory statement. If nothing is 100% true, then saying nothing is 100% true is not 100% true. <laughs> so it contradicts itself. So it goes around and around and around and around. Many in this modern day area, era accept that. They, they accept rather the fact that nothing is 100% true. So here's what they do. They live... With no beginning of wisdom, nor end of wisdom. It's whatever I think. It's whatever I imagine. It's whatever I come up with. So Jesus said this, absolutely. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Now, to accept that is wisdom. To reject that is nothing but foolishness. Christians are buying into statements because I, as a, as a preacher, you talk to someone. Well, preacher, you know, you know I, I know what... I, here's what I think, preacher. Okay, I don't have any problem with t people telling me their opinion. But if your opinion goes contradictory to the Word of God, we ought to submit to the Word of God and change our opinion. But that's not where we are today. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody, We never consult God's Word about it. You see, God's not the, only the beginning of where we start looking for wisdom. We consult God's Word so that we don't go over the line and uh, go out into perversion past the end of wisdom. So God's word is the end of wisdom also. We have a generation, I believe this is where this comes from, of no assurance Christians. No assurance Christians. Because they do not live by the end of wisdom or the final authority of wisdom. And therefore, you know, they step over into that line, and by the way, God built an inward monitor called a conscience. And when we cross that line, your conscience should bother you. It should bother somebody because that law is written into our hearts. But when a person go, crosses that line and they don't end where God says, Hey, don't go over here and don't do this. Don't, don't think these thoughts. Don't imagine these vain things here. And someone goes over there, first thing that happens is guilt starts. Guilt starts. Then what happens? The, the guilt, unconfessed, brings more guilt just stacked upon each other and stacked upon each other. That's why people have no assurance. They're so full of guilt. They're not free. They're confused about everything that's happening. And they, I, I just don't know where to, to, uh, uh, what to hold on to. Hey, that's why God said this. I'm the beginning of wisdom and I'm the end of wisdom. You keep what you're learning in between those lines. Someone has said this to me at, at times in my life. Preacher, how can you say that someone is lost when you don't even know them? I don't have to know them. Because I know the truth that all men are condemned until they receive Christ. Now... All right, I'll give you this. Years ago, uh, there was a pickup. on uh, Somebody had a pickup for sale, and it was a white one, white little Chevrolet. And uh, I was probably 21, 22, and, this, um, and I was on break from college stuff. I was at the house, and it was in the wintertime. 
I remember going pick it up, and they said, hey, take, take it home with you and test drive it. And I said, yeah, I'd like to show my mom and dad, stuff like that. So I drove the thing home, and I pulled up in the driveway and went inside. Mom said, supper's ready. I said, all right. So I went in there, and uh, we were sitting down to eat. And I, said, I said, Dad, I want you to come outside and look at the truck. I'm thinking about buying me this little pickup truck. He said, well, what kind is it? Chevrolet. And, uh, and then told him about it. It had a little six-cylinder stuff like this, short bed and stuff. And he said, what color is it? I said, white. So well, we'd kind of finished eating. After we talked, he got up from there. He went over to the picture window and looked out in the driveway. And by the time that he'd got up, I hadn't finished eating yet, uh, he was looking out and it started snowing. And then he turned around and looked at me and said, Hey, Ronnie. Because my dad's the only one ever called me Ronnie. First name. <laughs> he said, Hey, Ronnie, are you sure that thing's white? I said, Sure, it's white. He said, come over here. I went over and I looked out the window, and that snow had covered the top of it, and it looked like the sides of it were kind of a yellowish, muggish, off-white, mother of pearl. <laughs> but you know, I learned something. We don't, you see, I thought the truck was white, but the truck wasn't white when compared to something that really was white. It was off white. See, we don't have to experience wrong in order to know something is wrong. We have an end authority in the fear of the Lord. God said, here's the line. We stop right there and said, okay, Lord, uh, I'm just going to from now on. And here's when we get to that line, here's what we should do. Believe God. Just believe God. We don't get wisdom by what's around us. We get wisdom by taking what's around us and measuring it by what's above us. But most, that's this whole generation is what I uh, said, this whole foundation, this message. This whole generation looks all around them and that's right, that's wrong. Uh, I'm not sure about that. That's wrong, that's right. When we should be saying, Lord, what's right and wrong? What's right and wrong? What the era, this era has done is that it has made truth by looking left to right instead of up and down. When we should make sure our life is in line with what God said. Because here's what the Bible said. Everybody has sinned and come short. Not of the neighbor that lives on the hill in the big house and the, and the big car. Everybody has sinned and come short. Not of society standards. But of the glory of God. God doesn't change neither does wisdom. Now why is wisdom sure and strong? Because it's built on what doesn't change. So that's... A, so that's that's where we get our assurance. If we're full of sin, doing, crossing God's line of transgression, doing it our own thing, even justifying it by looking around on the side of us, then we cannot have true Bible assurance in our life. That true wisdom doesn't change. And wisdom comes on purpose. Now, our daily question to ourselves, I'm going to bring this down to ourselves here. Our daily question to ourselves should be this. Have I aligned my life this day with God? I'll tell you, one of the things that has, has destroyed our faith, has weakened our belief in God, is that we have become slack on making sure our life is in tune with God. Uh, that's why I say walk with God. You can't walk with God unless you agree with God. God's not going to change. Uh, and if you're walking with God, you're going to have to change. How can two walk together except they be, uh, be agreed? What does God command? What does He desire of us? What does He want? That should start our day, and it should structure our day. Every, most people do what they do by childhood training instead of conscious truth. Now, I'm not being disrespectful, but watch this. Thank God for great influences in our life, but to live only with past teaching is not what living by faith is all about. Living by faith is presently gaining God's wisdom for right now. My dad, hey, uh, flip over if you would to Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter number 4. My dad brought us up in church. I was two weeks old. When I went to church. By the time I left my mother and father's house, I could count on one hand. I guarantee you, I could count on one hand. In those 18 years uh, that I missed church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, Dad made sure it was in there. Many times, 
uh, I have met people that what I call a second generation Christian because that's what I was. My dad was saved the year I was born, 1964. And uh, second generation Christians oftentimes get a little bit of callousness about them because they didn't see a great change, but they, they were taught and they were brought up right. But somewhere along the line, that baton should have been picked up by them. Many times it's not. Many times, I know many people have testimonies of trying to get their children to serve God, to have just a desire to do what's right. Even, uh, I, even I myself uh, and our youngins that uh, don't attend church like they should. Boy, I think so many times, what was it? And we all kind of put ourselves on the griddle here sometimes. What was it that I missed? What, what did my dad have that I didn't have? You see what I'm saying? Most people, they will live their life by living it on what was taught them, but they won't go on for God. This is the whole testimony of Galatians 4. Notice what the Bible says, verse number 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. I miss my dad every day. He's been gone since uh, 2012. Many times I want to drive over after I used to do every Sunday uh, church on Sunday morning. I'd drive over and just sit in the living room. We would just talk. We just talk. We'd talk. I miss just doing that. But you know what? God, he was teaching me through that relationship that this relationship is going to end here because it's temporary. But your relationship with God should be the same, that you ought to go to God and go to God regularly. Go to God, and I believe the Bible teaches us daily. Why? Because living by faith is presently gaining God's wisdom on a day-by-day basis. So we cannot just go back and learn, I mean, live by everything that we've been taught. We must add to that. There's a stagnation. In this about being under the law and continuing on in uh, Galatians chapter number 4 here. We're free to grow now. Question is, are we growing? Yeah, Brother Dean, you know, I learned something this last week. Wait a minute now. Every day we ought to be seeking and learning. What we learned to get to Christ was necessary. But we should go a step farther and find out more of why that got us here. Why of the whys that got us here. That's what wisdom said. I love that old quote by G.K. Chesterton. He said this. Before you tear down a fence, you must find out why that fence was there in the first place. What was he saying? I'm saying the things that we have been taught in the past. Hey, we ought to figure out why we were taught them. How can we apply this to our personal uh, Christian life? Now, <clears throat> let me give you this here and then we'll be done. Let me ask you a question here. What are your commandments for your life? Everybody always talks about the Ten Commandments. Boy, that's a structure of society, and it is. And by the way, uh, our Constitution was, was built around the principles of that book right there. Never said we was a Christian nation. We were a nation built on Christian principles. But let me ask you, everybody always goes, oh, well, well, I believe the Bible, there's Ten Commandments back there, 512 of them scattered throughout the rest of the uh, books of Moses back there. Uh, but wait a minute now, has this brought this down personally to your life? What are the commandments to your life? How, if you looked in the mirror, how do you live for God? Are you consciously doing things? Are you thinking things through? Are you asking the Holy Spirit to guide you? You see, wisdom is not lax and lazy. But that's what we've become, a lot of Christians in this generation, and why we've let down our guard. Well, you know, preacher, I just kind of take things as they come. You know what? That's dangerous. That's dangerous. I think that was the attitude of Eve in the Garden of Eden when the snake and serpent came into the garden. She just no, oh, hey, Mr. Serpent, how are you? And she just took things as they come. When he said, you know, yea, hath God said, she should have stopped right there, turned on her uh, heels, and uh, went and found Adam. 
You see, it's dangerous just to take things as they come. We should be offensive and not defensive in our life. Looking for what we can do and say and walk and learn. You ever sit down and just journal? journal? I'm working on a message now and I think it's going to be good because it's it's helped me a lot just in the last two or three years ever since we started our bible reading thing i was really on, on a different bible reading thing then i gave one out to the church and hey i'm always i'm gonna ride your back like a redhead stepchild make sure you get in the word of god we all gotta do that because this flesh it, it, we all get a little lazy now if you got your own bible reading you're sticking to it hey uh go for that but we ought to have something that we're always consciously doing to grow our faith. Years ago, I, uh, oh, by the way, I'll get back to that thing of journaling. Uh, when we started that Bible reading thing, I, I picked up a journal. Just a, It was a sketch pad, actually, but it's got a little band around it, and I keep it with my Bible. And uh, when I get up, I read my uh, the Bible reading and stuff, and I'll write down the date and uh, the text, and then uh, I always, well, in the last six months, I write down where I'm at. I've, I've been reading the Bible all over about every state on the East Coast when I wake up in the morning and stuff. So I'll write down where I'm at. Uh, but here's the thing. I'll just write down the notes as I feel like God was just speaking to me. Many times I uh, have uh, in the past just, you know, read the Bible just to find out what to preach. But, you know, I want God to feed me too. And I want to grow also. And then uh, I'll know that it'll help our uh, uh, people to grow but watch this now I, so I, I'm using that thing of, of just journaling and writing things down so I can go back and just remind myself of what God has taught me on a day by day basis I used to teach the teenagers to do this I would say here's what every teenager needs to do you need to get you a piece of paper and you need to write you some commandments for your life now here's what I want you to do I want you to get a pen at the top of that page I want you to write unshakable and unbreakable and I want you to put rules you will live your life by and decide now to live your life that way because if you don't decide now when things come around and just happen you will often make the wrong decision in the emotion of the moment so I would say first of all write down this number one I will not ever Touch liquor and alcohol and beer and liquor, wine and all that. Why? Because your buddies are going to come around and they're going to try to get you to fit in with them. And they're going to try to get you to drink. So make you a rule. I said, write number two. And then I just was giving them some things. I will be faithful to church. So when it come, come, uh, when the time comes and a, a show's on TV, you'd rather watch that and go to church? Wait a minute now. Go back to your rules. You made some commandments for yourself. And you said, go to that rule. Number two says, I will go to church. So you go to church. You record it. You watch it later. You wait till it comes out on a rerun. Whatever it may be. But you go to church. Why? Those are your rules. You see, that's what it is. That's what teaching us is. And I would tell them, I say, listen, right number three, keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure before you get married. If you don't decide now to do it, you get in the back seat of the car with the opposite sex one day, you'll make the wrong decision then. So what I'm saying, we're not consciously living our life on purpose. Now, I know most adults don't have to contend with youthful values, but we do have life left to follow a little bit closer to Christ. So let me ask all of us in this room, anybody that may be listening, have we committed to growing or adding to our faith today? Have we committed or growing or adding to our faith today? In the mornings, I slip at times. I do because uh, I, I get tired like everybody else. But in the mornings, I decide what I'm going after I've read the Bible. And uh, I decide which direction I'm going to think that day. Oh, I get tired in the afternoons, and then my mind starts wondering about everything i got to do. Or, oh, man, I'd like to do this. I need to go buy this. and all. I, But I have to bring my thoughts back in. Years ago, I used to watch preachers, still do, by the way, and learn what great men do. To, they, they set goals and things like that for themselves. I just wrote down a few of them today as I was thinking about this. You know, Jack Hiles, he was one of my heroes, and I got to study in him. He was my pastor for four years. He told us preacher boys this. He never prays less than 20 hours a week, 
never goes soul winning less than 20 hours a week and never studies his Bible less than 20 hours a week. Now show me that in the book, our brother. Where's that in the book? That's not in the book. That's something somebody set for themselves to help them to make sure their flesh doesn't turn lax and lazy. I met a preacher when I was a teenager. He was down here in Bristol, and he had a huge growing church. And I was just talking to him. He had this. He said, you know what I do? Every week, I knock on 101 doors minimum. And by the way, when Brother Howes used to say that, he said he often prayed more than just 20 hours, often read the Bible and studied the Bible more than it. But that's a minimum requirement for himself, he said on himself. This preacher down in Bristol, he said, uh, I knock on 101 doors every week and invite people to church. That kind of filed that away in my mind. When I was in Bible college, I a, met a, a preacher out of Staten Island, New York. and his ch didn't have a large church. But they were just, I mean, you know how people in New York just stacked on top of each other? He said, I invite 1,000 people to Christ every week. 1,000 people. He had, a, he had a growing church. but The diversity up there is so difficult. Here's what D.L. Moody said. I will not let 24 hours go by without witnessing to at least one person. What was he doing? He, he said, I remember him. He woke up one night, 1130. He said, the Holy Spirit woke me up, and I hadn't witnessed to one person. I went on the streets of Chicago, and I found a fellow sitting under a street lamp, and I witnessed to that man led him to Christ. He said, 24. I met a preacher in California. His name was David Smith, a good man, good man. He said this, my people read on a Bible schedule. I preach from one of those passages each week. That was a goal he set for himself. You know, Lester Roloff, of course, he's in heaven now. He said this, while he was in Bible college, I will have one unin uninterrupted hour with God every morning, every day of the week. What am, what am I saying? I'm saying this. These fellows had command. They had a beginning. Yes, I'm trusting the Lord. I have an end. I'm not going to go past what God says. But I need to grow in that belief in God. That has a beginning and it has an end. And it's going to be on purpose. And what is absolute, what is eternal, that I can add to my faith in the in where God, in the bounds that God says to do it. I'm not just going to think frivolously. I'm going to read. I'm going to witness. I'm going to bless others. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to meditate. You know where wisdom comes from? Oh, boy, that's a wise person. And we see, him, we see it on display. But I wrote this down because I got to thinking about this. Wisdom displayed comes by wisdom deposited. When we learn, God brings it back when we need it. When we make sure that our end of our wisdom... Now, you wake up tomorrow, I wake up tomorrow, we'll be doing our thing, and there's you're going to hear a radio. You're going to see a TV. You're going to hear conversations of people. You're, and every one of them, they're, they're going to be way out there. Many of them will not be any kind of constructive by any means. Some of them will often be criti critical and, and tearing people down. They're, they're, see, those are outside the lines. God says, don't, don't, do, don't, don't listen to that. Don't fill your mind up with all that. There's a beginning. That's fear and meets when you start seeking it. And then you get to that point where you start learning things. Don't go cross that line. The end, make the end. Still the fear of God. That's what he's saying there. So when our day comes, we ought to be actively seeking something for God. If I ask you right now, what are you going to be doing in the morning? Or tomorrow, if you're busy early in the morning or something like that, and it takes you a little while to get up, three or four cups of coffee or whatever, it may take you to get up, then what, do you, what time tomorrow will you meet God? What time tomorrow will you thank God? What are you going to be thinking about tomorrow? Uh, who are you thinking? Who are you going to be crossing paths with you haven't talked to in a long time that you could already plan right now to say, you know what? This is the day I'm going to invite them. This is the day I'm going to re-invite them. This is the day I'm going to really push for a decision. You know, just every day we ought to be positive. We ought to be um, uh, consciously in that direction, putting into our life things of wisdom. Heavenly Father, I pray you take these thoughts this evening. God, I pray you please help us. 
help us to make some commandments for ourselves. Well, we know thy commandments in the Bible, and we've studied them, and we practice them as best we can, and sometimes the flesh maybe get the best of us, but Lord, thank you so much for forgiveness. But Lord, I pray most of all, Lord, that you'd help every one of us to help us to parent ourselves. Doesn't matter our age, doesn't matter how much wisdom and maturity we got, just help us to pattern ourselves. Father, keep us in thy will. Thank you, Lord, that when we get to the end of what we don't understand, all we have to do is just turn to you and say, I believe you, Lord. I'm going to stop right here. And I pray you control my mind and teach me things beyond my understanding that only you would have me to know. God, I pray you'd do that for us. Keep us safe on this uh, as we take go our separate ways this evening and help us to walk with you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, good evening. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. Let's invite someone to the Lord's house.